morning, everyone, and welcome to the service here at Life Community Baptist Church. Welcome to those here in the Phoenix and those joining at home live with us through Zoom. Hello, those on, at home. <laughs> and also those joining us later on the recorded service on YouTube. I'm Julie, and I've got my name tag left on from yesterday. We went on a course, just in case you're wondering who I am. <laughs> I will lead you through the service this morning. Helped only by Maureen, Matt, and Martin. Thanks, guys. If you'd like to find out more about us, check out our website, which is life-baptist.org.uk. Today, excuse me, we're looking at Christian households and how we should live our lives at home as God has designed us to, where we are hidden from the outside world but God sees all. Difficult subject, which Pete will be speaking to us later on. Uh, from Ephesians chapters 5 and 6, entitled In the Living Room. Interesting title. We will also be sharing in communion later, so those taking part at home, please have some bread and wine or non-alcoholic beverage ready if you want to join us in that. So I'd like to start with a prayer from the uh, Anglican Book of Common Prayer, which is the collect for uh, the nearest this Sunday. Blessed Lord, who caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning, grant us so to hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life, which you have given us in our Saviour, Jesus Christ who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, for ever and ever. Amen. Amen. Today uh, is Remembrance Sunday, and as we remember the war, the Great War, there are also so many troubled areas in our world, with wars ongoing and immense human suffering. Although war has ended in Afghanistan, there is no peace in that country. As today, remember those who fell in World War I. Let's pray for all those caught up in war zones. Father of all, remember your holy promise and look with love on all your people, living and departed. On this day, we especially ask that you would hold forever all who have suffered during war, those who returned scarred by warfare, those who waited anxiously at home, and those who returned wounded and disillusioned those who mourned, and those communities that were diminished and suffered loss. Remember too those who acted with kindly compassion, those who bravely risked their own lives for their comrades, and those who in the aftermath of war worked tirelessly for a more peaceful world. As you remember them, remember us, O Lord. Grant us peace in our time, and a longing for the day when people of every language, race, and nation will be brought into the unity of Christ's kingdom. We ask this now in the name of the same Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. So as we come to worship, we want to remember that we are God's family. We're gathered together this morning. We want to sing and praise him. So if you'd like to stand, if you can, let's worship the Lord.
sacrifices as we try and live lives worthy of your name. Thank you, Father. You are the King of Kings, Majesty. Let's worship King of Kings. to remember that you are the king of all. Thank you, Father, that we are worthy to sing your praises and come into your presence this morning. Holy Spirit, come be among us. Maureen's going to lead us in, in prayers now. Thank you, Maureen. Okay. <coughs> All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, a statement well known to Christians and the beginning of the litany of reconciliation said every weekday at noon in Coventry Cathedral. Since it was rebuilt after the mass bombing, of the city in World War II, destroying the medieval building in November 1940. 
I only know this because my husband John and I recently visited the cathedral when up in Coventry visiting friends and family as John was born in the city of Coventry. While there we attended the midday prayer of reconciliation which came about by this terrible act of destruction which provoked a special response by the community of Coventry led by Provost Dick Howard. This began a message of peace, forgiveness and reconciliation, both with God and all humankind. This litany is read by the canon of the cathedral in present day. The congregation just respond by repeating Father forgive at the end of each sentence. And I'm going to read it now. If you'd like to um, say Father forgive after each sentence, that would be great. That all I have, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The hatred which divides nations from nation, race from race, class from class. Father, forgive. The covetous desires of people and nations to possess what is not their own. Father, forgive. The greed which exploits the work of human hands and lays waste the earth. Father, forgive. Our envy of the welfare and happiness of others. Father, forgive. Our indifference to the plight of the imprisoned, the homeless, the refugee. Father, forgive. The lust which dis dishonours the bodies of men, women and children. Father, forgive. Provide which leads us to trust in ours, ourselves and not in God. Father, forgive. Be kind to one another tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. Amen. So may we remember to endeavour to forgive our enemies and bless our wrongdoers as Jesus commanded in the Great Commission to love one another as we love ourselves. Let us pray. Lord, thank you that my generation in this country and younger have never yet had to experience the trials, tribulations and devastation of war as those before us who fought in the great world wars and battles of the past age. We take this time today to remember the fallen dead and injured who suffer great loss in order to keep the country safe from enemy invasion and thank you for your help in protecting us. Some of us know that in times of trouble, and especially during the world wars, people willingly turned to you, Lord, and prayed to you um, to be saved uh, from harm and death at the hands of the enemy. And we thank you that you are always there as our strong tower, protector and refuge. And that if we know you as our Lord and Saviour, even death has no sting anymore because of what you Lord Jesus did for us on the cross at Calvary. We pray for all the survivors and loved ones left after the war, bereaved and damaged, including the modern servicemen of today. Please give them comfort and peace and help them to forgive those who caused such atrocities and devastation in the throes of battle. Heal the injured and sick, we pray, and bring this country back to your bosom once more, telling people who is, the who is the true king of this earth and universe. We remember the homeless and sick of Horsham and ask that you may find them shelter and healing in this town. We remember those members of our church here at Life who are suffering in oh so many ways, whether physically, emotionally, or mentally. Restore them and our pastor Pete to full health so he will be able to fulfil his duties as shepherd of this church to the best of his abilities. And may we welcome more people around this community to come and know Jesus and be saved through your forgiveness of our sins and wrongdoings. Thank you, Lord, for all your love and provisions which we do not deserve. 
but you still lavish us with because you love us so much. Hear now our words of praise, thanks and forgiveness. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. Thank you, Maureen. We're going to have um, two minutes of silence, but it's not quite 11 o'clock yet. According to my phone, I've got five minutes to wait. <laughs> it, it, this timing is always difficult. <laughs> Um, I thought I might start reading um, from the passage that Pete is going to be speaking to us later. Um, will someone let me know when it's just before 11? Um, I'm going to read the passage in Ephesians, which is chapter 5, verse 21, to chapter 6, verse 9. And I'd like to read from the message version. And this passage is all about relationships. Out of respect for Christ, be courteously reverent to one another. Wives, understand and support your husbands in ways that show your support for Christ. The husband provides leadership to his wife the way Christ does to his church, not by domineering but by cherishing. So just as the church submits to Christ as he exercises such leadership, wives should likewise submit to their husbands. Husbands, go all out in your love for your wives, exactly as Christ did for the church, a love marked by giving, not getting. Christ's love makes the church whole. His words evoke her beauty. Everything he does and says is designed to bring the best out of her, dressing her in dazzling white silk, radiant with holiness. And that is how husbands ought to love their wives. They're really doing themselves a favour, since they're already one in marriage. No one abuses his own body, does he? No, he feeds and pampers it. That's how Christ treats us, the church church since we are part of his body and this is why a man leaves father and mother and cherishes his wife no longer two they become one flesh this is a huge mystery and i don't pretend to understand it all what is clearest to me is the way christ treats the church and this provides a good picture of how each husband is to treat his wife loving himself in loving her and how each wife is to honor her husband children do what your parents tell you this is only right Honour your father and mother is the first commandment that has a promise attached to it, namely, so you will live well and have a long life. Fathers, don't frustrate your children with no-win scenarios. I like that one. <laughs> Take them by the hand and lead them in the way of the master. Servants, respectfully obey your earthly masters, but always with an eye to obeying the real master, Christ. Don't just do what you have to do to get by, but work heartily as Christ's servants, doing what God wants you to do. And work with a smile on your face, always keeping in mind that no matter who happens to be giving the orders, you're really serving good God. Good work will get you good pay from the master, regardless of whether you are slave or free. Masters, it's the same with you. No abuse, please, and no threats. You and your servants are both under the same master in heaven. He makes no distinction between you and them. of minutes to go so um, we can quietly wait for the, the silence to begin um, I like those words I think it it's, uh, explains more about how uh, Christ loves us and how we should love each other and I know Pete will uh, expand on that a bit more later a, bit, a difficult subject sometimes contentious but um, it all makes sense when you delve deep into the meaning of Paul's words and where he's coming from. If we could have the slide up, the uh, remembrance slide. Thank you. So we have two minutes silence from now to remember all those fallen in the wars.
Thank you, Father. Amen. Pete is now going to come and lead us in communion. Thank you, Pete. Symbols are a powerful thing. Many of us today have got poppies on. Remember paper poppies? Or wristbands your son brought from home. <laughs> but symbols remind us of deeper things. And as we remember the sacrifice of those who've given their lives in the war, we remember the sacrifice that Christ gave for us. As he gave his life upon the cross. So as we come to share, we remember ourselves before God and we ask for his forgiveness of our sins. That we may come to the Lord with clean hands and clean hearts. Pause for a while. Lord, forgive us for our sins. Forgive us, Lord, for the things that we have done wrong. For the things that we have forgotten to do that are good. Lord, forgive us. Lord, for the times we thought only of ourselves and not of others. Lord, forgive us. For the times we've chosen to stay in hostility rather than forgive and seek peace. Lord, forgive us. Lord, thank you that we come, not in the, the off chance that you might forgive us, but in the certainty that through your sacrifice that you've promised that you will forgive us. So forgive us this day, restore us, that we may come to you with clean hands and clean hearts and worship you in spirit and truth. Amen. And as a sign of that forgiveness, we're going to clean our hands. And Sarah is bringing round some gel. The Jews would have washed their hands ceremonially. Nowadays we use Alka gel. <laughs> but it's that reminder to come clean before God. Because as I read from those words of Paul, a reminder that the passage actually starts with uh, division and conflict. And Paul calls for unity as we remember in sacrifice. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. Then on the night that he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it, saying, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant, sealed in my blood. Whenever you drink this, you drink in remembrance of me. For when you eat of this bread and drink of this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. So we break bread, the symbol of his body broken for us, freely given for our lives.
symbol of the blood that Jesus shed to bring the wine. And then as we're saved as the body of Christ, we drink together. Smaller tray is non-alcoholic. Lord, we thank you for your love and your forgiveness and new life in you. Amen. Pray for Pete as he brings us your word. Um, 
difficult subject, please empower him with your Holy Spirit. We ask that you open up our hearts to receive your life-giving message today. Amen. And you're right, this isn't necessarily the easiest of passages in our culture, but hopefully as we go through it might make a bit more sense of what Paul was perhaps angling in. Let me start with a question. Let's get straight to it, shall we? <laughs> Love. Would you say that's a positive word or a negative word? Hands up if it's positive. Excellent. I, I thought most people would say that. Anyone, anyone for negative? No? Excellent. Um, what about submit? The other word in the passage. Do you think is a positive word or a negative word? Anyone for positive? Anyone for negative? You want an in-between? Both hands for in-between. <laughs> See, that's one of the problems with our passage today, isn't it? That the words in it can be both positive and negative. But how Paul tends to use them is in a positive way. The past few weeks we've been looking at different parts of chapter 5. At the beginning of chapter 5 says, Follow God's example as dearly loved children. Live a life of love just as Christ loved us and gave himself for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Sacrifice that we just remembered in communion. Very positive. But the same positive way of, li- of following and, and putting that love into practice ends at uh, the end of, oh, sorry, everyone, chapter 5, verse 21. Just after be saying, Paul is writing about being godly, being wise in your living, being spirit-filled. He says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. He uses that positively in the sense of uh, the word, the original meaning of the word, which is put under or put yourself before another. Being a a choice to be humble, to be humble like Christ, a, a positive use of the words rather than that forcing another to submit. And that forcing another to submit isn't what Paul is talking about here. And at this point, we, we haven't even got to today's passage. We're still talking about um, that love and that mutual submission that, that Paul is addressing to everyone in the congregation that were there listening. Males, females, Jews and Gentiles, children, adults, slave and free. Everyone is to have those attitudes, those attitudes of Christ. The one who gave himself for us. And remember that as we think through these different areas that Paul speaks about. But before we do, we just need to, to think a little about uh, the culture that Paul was re- write, writing to. Writing to, that's the right word. <laughs> writing to, isn't it? So he's writing to first century Ephesians in the Roman culture. And that's the context, we need to read them. And the Roman culture had a very strict social hierarchy. You had the emperor at the top, Caesar, then the wealthy landowners, and then the ruling senators, then the working class, then the freemen, and then the slaves, which we'll come on to later. And that strict social hierarchy was in the family as well. The, in family life, you had a paterfamilias. Hopefully I'll pronounce that correctly. Uh, which literally means father of the family, or the oldest male in the household, who had absolute control over all decisions, over the family's resources, the land, the business, and even who you could marry. And when I say fam- family, I don't just mean one household. That was everyone. So that included those who worked in the household. It included those, the adult children who had moved out and got married and had children of their own. The paterfamilias was still head of the whole family overall. And sometimes that got a bit complicated. Like when somebody did get married, as they often did in first century Ephesus. 
Um, typically, it was a, a six-year-old, 16-year-old girl, and say, a man in his late 20s or 30s. It was just the way they did it in that culture. Marriage would have been an arranged marriage. So it was based on uh, what was good for the family status and wealth, rather than love. Though I hope there was love in there. It was just secondary to the process of getting married. And at that time, the, the paterfamilias was still the one over you. If you got married, the one you looked up to to make decisions was still your dad or your granddad. Even if like for both men and women, it wasn't a unity forming a new set in that marriage. It was still the different ends of the, the family heads who were in control. So you weren't necessarily have that complete unity as we might talk of marriage today. But as I speak about this, I'm just gonna sideline into Artemis. Anyone remember who Artemis is? The Free Musketeers. <laughs> uh, not the one I was thinking of. The one I was thinking of was um, Artemis, the Greek goddess. Um, when Paul, well, it was when Paul was leaving Ephesus uh, in a riot, it was the, the metalsmiths who made idols and stuff for the Temple of Artemis that handed him out of the city. Um, because uh, the Temple of Artemis was a big thing. In fact, it was one of the seven wonders of the world, just to put it in context how important it was for uh, the people in Ephesus. And Artemis was um, a god, a goddess, who was uh, worshipped for, uh, for women and childbirth and children. She was uh, known as protector of them. And she was a young, a role model for the women of Ephesus, a strong, independent woman, a skilled hunter who could fend herself in the wild, a woman who chose to remain single because the stories tell that she was mistreated by male suitors. And so you have all of this in the culture that Paul is writing to when he's talking about marriage and children and servants or slaves. So as Paul was writing this, I imagine like, this is the culture we've got at the moment. What would it look like if that culture was infused with the gospel message? He wasn't in a position to completely transform culture, being a, a prisoner at the time, but he could share how the gospel message could infuse that culture to begin to subvert it and make a change to, to get everyone to adopt that Christ-like attitude of loving sacrificially and humbly putting others first, all in honour of Jesus. And that's what Paul's trying to do, to, to submert, su subvert the culture from within. You've already heard Julie reading the passage, so I won't read it all again. But I will just talk about the different parts in there. The wives respecting and submitting to your husbands. And the husbands loving as Christ did. Giving yourself for the woman you love. These have often been mistreated, mis misinterpreted or or actually not misinterpreted, just used to suppress women throughout the ages. But I don't think that's what Paul was, was trying to write about here. Because everyone, as we started, everyone was called to love one another, to give yourself in putting others first and submitting mutually to one another. And that's the context. It's not that, that women, you have to do this, men, you have to do that. Just everyone has to love and give yourself to others completely. But what he does here is kind of saying, well, you've got a new Lord. You've all got a new paterfamilias of the household. You've all 
got new ways of doing things. So wives, you're no longer controlled by your controlling father or grandfather. You're not even kind of that controlled by your husband, even if that's the legal realities of the day. But don't adopt the, the model of the, uh, the independent Artemis who just wants to be on her own. Think of what love could be like coming together and breaking the cultural conventions of the day. Honor the one you love. The one who is breaking the cultural conventions as well. Who wants to treat you like Christ loves you. Who wants to see you radiant in beauty and a godly character. That's what marriages can be when infused with the love of Christ. A kind of a, a relationship that opens up the mysteries of heaven. Did you notice as this read that Paul gets to the point of saying, Hang on, I'm a bit, bit, bit confused. Am I talking about human relationships or, or heaven? I don't know what I'm talking about here. It's like he's trying to express the inexpressible ministries of heaven. Simply saying that your relationships radiate the love of God. And they're completely giving of yourself to one another. In a way that honours Christ in your relationships. But also that others will see and say, Actually, there's something different going on here. Imagine what it'd be like for the Romans going to a party and actually treating the ones you love differently with respect and honour. No marriage is perfect. No relationship is either. But the challenge here is what direction are we travelling in? What are we aiming for? Are we aiming for our, our relationships to be just like those, that of those around us? Or are we aiming to say yes? We want, our, we want Christ at the centre of our relationships. Something for you to think about. Second of the three sections then talks about children. Children obeying their parents. I'm looking over to my son right now. <laughs> and fathers or parents not exasperating your children, which Caleb pointed out to me while he was reading it to you. <laughs> this too has been used to, well, used oppressively. But again, Paul is trying to subvert the culture, infuse it with the good news of the love of Christ. The emphasis here is on training and guiding, helping those you look after to grow, to grow not just in the, the way of the culture, but in the way of the Lord, in love for the Lord, in doing what you can not to frustrate them or set a bad example that they just look at you and say if this is what faith looks like I'm out of here but as I talk about parents and children in the households of the time that would have been whatever age the children was not necessarily infants in fact the the words uh, used here has a different word for infants so this was any children whoever whether adults or, uh, I'll say adult or child, doesn't work. <laughs> doesn't quite work yet. But yes, it's not the age that matters. It's that relationship. A relationship where you're saying, I want to model something for the next generation of what it means to love and give yourself. And that's important. Passing on your, the, your faith to the next generation for those in your care. And Paul in this section says, quotes one of the Ten Commandments, honour your father and mother so it may go well with you and you might enjoy a long, earth, long life on this earth. And it got me thinking, that was the, um, from Deuteronomy 5, Moses was speaking just as the people were about to enter the promised land. 
I wonder what they thought when Moses was saying that. Because the generation that entered the promised land had a, their parents' generation were the ones who said, mm, we don't trust God enough to go in. Which resulted in the 40 years of wandering around the wilderness. Interesting mix there of passing on faith. Almost the parable of saying, we got to make sure we pass on our faith. Otherwise, otherwise, we're going to be wiped out. And no one will believe. And no one will get to, to know the love of God. If we don't do all that we can to pass on our faith. And that's not just a passing on of faith to those we are related to, but the, the, those whom we work with as well. As part of the Roman household, there would have been many servants. And Paul says, servants, listen to your masters. And masters, love your servants. Actually, a word that Paul uses in the Greek is doulos, which can be translated as servant or slave. In our country, lenses, there's a huge division between the two. When you think of slaves, I think of the transatlantic slave uh, trade, where millions were captured and forced to work on plantations for, for profit, for us. Is radically different from the word servant, which in my mind is Downton Abbey. <laughs> but in Paul's day, servants and slaves were one. In fact, suggested that perhaps in Ephesus, about 40 to 50 percent of the population were slaves. Some prisoners of war, others brought in, or others because the family had fallen on hard times and, and had to sell themselves to a master, to pay their debts and to feed their family. It was, it was better than starving to death. <coughs> and these slaves or servants could have worked as manual laborers or highly skilled craftsmen. But the common factor was no legal rights. A crime against them wouldn't be punished. But they did have the hope of becoming free, of paying off their debts. And that was a motivation that kept many going. And like other bits of the, this wider passage we're looking at, in the past it's been used to justify slavery, but that's not what Paul is talking about here. He was trying to subvert it, a practice he couldn't get rid of, but he can't try and change the attitudes of those in it. A call. Cool to love and to give yourself to other. Because for both, those who had no rights and those who had all the power, Christ is the King and the Lord over all. I just want you to imagine a communion table of that day. A communion table where you'd have the posh Roman masters in all their finery sitting at the same table as the slave, the servant, and the poor. Culture, that didn't happen. That would never happen. But around the communion table of Christ, it could happen. Imagine for a moment how the servants and the slaves and the poor would have felt in that moment, being welcomed in. What would those wealthy, the social elite, think? And they're so used to a culture 
that ignores half the population. But around the communion table are welcomed in. And lastly, what do you think the neighbours would have thought to see this happening, to hear of this happening, of this which is beyond culture for them? I wonder how they would have responded, positively or negatively, as they saw a society infused by the love of God and the giving and putting of your others first. A preview of the family of God united and free around the throne of heaven. We've got different uh, pairs of relationships here in this passage and today's culture is wildly different. We know that it is. But in each of the areas that Paul has talked about and others too, reminds us that we have the opportunities today to do things differently than our culture, to subverse the, the negative aspects of our culture with the positive model of Jesus, the story of the good news of loving first of putting others first. Starting place, that as we live in these attitudes, we'll be sharing the gospel. That when others look in, they'll see something different. And if you're the only believer in your, your family, your, your household, your workplace, your friendship group, then it's tough. But keep loving. Keep putting others first. Live for that attitude and see what God can do. That might be a choice to love when others just want to simmer in hate or apathy. That's gospel living. Might be a choice to forgive when others would prefer to walk away. That's gospel living. Could be a choice to, to care and care, <laughs> even when others are either uncaring or happy for you to take on all the work. That can be gospel living. Don't give up. Keep living out the gospel and know that you are making a difference. Keep praying for them that they will see, they, they will respond to the gospel as you live it out, as you make a difference in your daily lives. And as you pray, we pray with you. We stand together as a community of believers, praying for them, that their lives may be touched by the love of Christ. And if you are in a position of helping others grow in the faith, as there's like the parents and with the children Paul was talking of, then do what you can to model that. Don't just say, this is how you should be, but model how you want them to be in your life. And share your faith in actions and of words. And their faith is probably gonna look very different from you. Culture changes so rapidly. Even Caleb's culture is very different from my culture. But we can still guide them as we love them. And remember, in all of our relationships, living the way of the Lord changes the world, even if we don't see it. So it's reflecting on what Paul was saying, that he wasn't in a position to change the world of slavery, but those who came after him could. The baton of faith that was passed down from generation to generation the faith of the, the William Wilberforces and the Martin Luther Kings and all those who worked alongside, standing up against injustices and selfishness 
of humanity to transform our societies. Their actions in the past still impact us today, just as our actions today will impact our tomorrows and the tomorrows of tomorrows. So let us this day choose, choose to live for the Lord, to work for the Lord, to serve him and worship him. There is one Lord, one saviour, one God and king over all. And I realise I'm running quite short of time. So I want to leave you with one question. That hopefully will appear on the screen. What does it look like for you to love like Christ and to put others before yourself in your own home, your own situation, your own workplace. I was on that for a few minutes. Yeah. So just pause for a minute just to reflect on that. And then we'll just turn to those around us and to share. Yeah, we're just talking about at home, we can be different people than we are outside. Mm. And, um, you know, we put on a happy face when we're out and make people think that everything's okay in our lives. It isn't always. Mm. At home, you can relax and be yourself. But you've still got to think of the other people in your household and encourage mm. them. Yeah. So you try and keep on being encouraging, even with, you know, non-believers in the household. Mm. So it's not easy because right. we're no better than them. Mm. You know, in some cases, you know, very generous and do more good works than I do. Mm. But it's just, I think it's love. I think as you were saying in your message, that the key word to come out of this is, is love everyone, however you feel about them. Mm. And that will just radiate out and hopefully change our lives and change theirs. Yeah. Yeah. Thank yeah. you for that. Thank you. Anyone else? Oh, anyone from Oh, sorry, Zoom? yes, Zoomers. Want to share? Wave yeah. if you do, Andy will. Do the magic. No, no, all okay. quiet at home. Sink, sinking in. I'm sure we can mm. continue discussions. Yeah. Anyone from the other group? Oh, we. Right. I just oh, Andy. Yes. So when, when you read it, and, and I started looking, uh, was reading it, and then. The, I think the, the thing about slaves and, and masters, we always forget that, um, that that was the reality of the social thing. That was the, the way that people lived. There, there were slaves and masters. And, and, you know, Paul is not ignoring that, but he does point out right at the end that, um, for you know, both of you have the same master in heaven and with him, there is no partiality. Mm. And that's, you know, the fact that he talks about slaves and masters doesn't mean that God sees a slave or a master as any different from each other. Mm. Mm. And that, that, you know, that applies to wives and husbands. There are social things which are reality, the way that society is structured, there's culture, there's everything else. But at the end of the day, we're all the same. And that, that for me is the, yeah. the real mm. sort of where it really changes. Yeah, that's the difference. And I'm glad you pointed it out because <laughs> the big theme of Ephesians is unity, isn't it? Absolutely. Of yeah. well, and actually, you were talking about that passage, actually, weren't you? <laughs> the <laughs> unity that yeah. actually, although the society of the day, much like our society, was divided into different groups mm -hmm. and different uh, cultures and different attitudes, in Christ we are one. In Christ mm -hmm. we are united as a new family under yeah. Christ here on earth as we will be in heaven and we were all made created in the image of God yes amen <laughs> amen so let's um worship yes. have one more worship song before we close thank you thanks Pete Let's 
praise God and thank him for his amazing love. We'll sing hallelujah. <clears throat> Once the guitar is ready. <laughs> Sorry. praises thank you that we can sing that we are allowed to sing in this country that we are your children and you made us equal in your sight and you love us all equally help us to love everyone in our household in our families our friends our neighborhood help us to spread your love and just shine with your love as you love us thank you father i'd like to pray before we uh, stop the recording for those watching later. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Loving God, we thank you for hearing our prayers this morning, feeding us with your word. 
and encouraging us in our meeting together. Take us and use us to love and serve you and all people in the power of your spirit, in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. 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 It's time to say goodbye to those watching on, on Zoom and YouTube. And uh, thank you for joining us. I hope you enjoyed the service. Uh, bless you throughout the week. And please join us again next week. Bye.